The King of New Orleans. By Greg Klein. Chapter 3. Race, Raslin, and Nola. Before professional wrestling was covered on national cable TV, the ethnic babyface played a big part in the economics of the business. Cities all over the country had their local variations. The Southwest and big cities in Texas and California favored Mexicans. The Crusher was a Midwestern hero partly because of his Polish heritage. The Northeast specialized in Italians and Puerto Ricans, as evidenced by two worldwide wrestling federation, WWWF, babyface champions of the 60s and 70s, Bruno Sammartino and Pedro Morales. Ethnic babyfaces drew big crowds under certain circumstances, a traveling star from Mexico like Gory Guerrero or Mil Mascaras, could sell out Houston, Los Angeles, or even New York for a big match. Whatever the reason, these babyfaces often drew the biggest, most passionate crowds. When these favorites lost, especially if it was because of a cheating heel, riots were possible. Ultimately, if they weren't portrayed as invincible, they weren't draws at all. Because of this, ethnic babyfaces were booked to almost never lose. For example, when Morales lost the WWWF belt to Stan Stasiak in Philadelphia, the ring announcer didn't announce the title change with the usual enthusiasm. Instead, when Stasiak won a disputed finish, the referee didn't raise his hand, and the announcer said, let's hear it for a great champion, Pedro Morales. Fearing retribution from Morales fans, the WWWF let its audience know that there had been a title change from the safety and distance of the next week's television program. When Sammartino lost the title to the hated Russian Ivan Koloff, who was actually from Canada, fears of violence were so high that after Koloff lost the title to Morales, he skipped out on the Northeastern rings for most of the rest of his career, despite the potential for money-making rematches. Of course, ethnic bad guys have also been a staple of wrestling. In the 50s, World War II, inspired German and Japanese villains were in. The Cold War added Russians to the mix, the hostage crisis, and oil cartels of the 70s created Arab and Iranian heels. Over his career, the Iron Sheik played both Arab and Persian, and during the 90s Gulf War he added Iraqi to his resume. When Sheik Adnan al Kasi and Sergeant Slaughter did a pro-Iraqi gimmick in 1991, at the height of the conflict, it was one of the few times that the ethnic card was deemed to be in such bad taste that even the wrestling community rebelled. Still, it didn't hurt Slaughter's career to go from a patriotic, G.I. Joe-sponsored hero to an American turncoat, even though he was nearing retirement and in the worst shape of his career, Slaughter nabbed his only world title run by pretending to be an Iraqi sympathizer. Pro wrestling critics often base their disapproval on stereotypes and xenophobia in the sport. On one point, at least, critics and supporters agree, wrestling does, in fact, exploit nationality and ethnic stereotypes to create drama. The only difference between the two groups is that wrestling supporters seem to enjoy the use of character. Certainly, they defend it. When Terry Funk's protege, John Bradshaw Layfield, made international headlines for goose stepping during a match on a World Wrestling Entertainment, WWE, tour of Germany, Funk defended him. Writing in his memoirs, Terry Funk, more than just hardcore, he supports both Bradshaw and the industry practice. When Bradshaw did his goose stepping, he ended up getting the crap beat out of him in the ring, so it was a case of the heel getting what was coming to him, wrote Funk. When he sold for Eddie Guerrero and The Undertaker later in the match, he took the idea of what he'd been representing and he destroyed it. Eddie and Undertaker destroyed the whole Nazi regime in that match. In Mid-South, Bill Watts loved ethnic villains as much as anybody. During two periods in the 80s, Watts had Russian headliners. He went so far as to have one of his own stampede comebacks after getting buried under a Russian flag. He always seemed to have an undercard Arab character to take a beating, and fellow Oki turned Arab Skander Akbar rotated through the territory as one of the top managers. Kamala played his typical character in Mid South as the Ugandan giant or, to view it more offensively, a black savage. When Ray Candy returned years later, it was as Kareem Muhammad, a Black Panther slash Muslim type heel. There were even a few old school Japanese and Germans along the way, 30 years after their heyday. Clearly, race played some factor in booking. Kamala, Muhammad, and even Ernie Ladd played on white fears about blacks in general, or black society and culture specifically. However, Watts and Bookers of his era were never as blunt as Jim Cornette of Smoky Mountain Wrestling a decade later. Cornette saw his audience as a bunch of Appalachian rednecks, so he served up a stereotype tag team of black criminals called the Gangsters. As with the Gulf War angle, it was one of the few times the wrestling community showed outrage over an offensive angle based on race or ethnicity. Inside the ring, however, it was just business. Ironically, with little tweaking to the act, a few years later the gangsters became huge fan favorites in Extreme Championship Wrestling's home base of Philadelphia and the Northeast. 
from an outsider's perspective, the South would appear to offer many opportunities to use race-baiting angles like the gangsters, but even in the South, the demographics vary. The Appalachian areas of Tennessee, Kentucky and Virginia are almost exclusively white. Pockets of the South, especially the Deep South states along the Gulf Coast, have huge black populations, often more than 30% of the total. Louisiana and Mississippi have had two of the largest black populations historically, and continue to do so today. Further, big cities in the South as well as other places, have always had larger black populations than suburbs. In the Northeast, blacks are most often concentrated in the urban areas, but this is only half true in the Southeast. That is to say, black populations can be quite large in rural areas, too, as in the so-called Black Belt of Western Alabama and in the Mississippi Delta region. However, it is still true that southern cities tend to have even larger black populations. New Orleans itself has at times been more than 70% black. Little Rock, Houston, Jackson, and other Mid-South cities also had huge black populations. While that makeup has seemingly peaked, and the demographics have changed by a few percentage points in the 21st century, the Mid-South era was the height of the peak. In the 80s, blacks made up 70% of the population of New Orleans. The states of Louisiana and Mississippi were both close to 35% black. Bill Watts and Ernie Ladd were students of the statistics. When Ladd was working in opposition to Tri-State in Mississippi and wanted out, he called up Watts and told him he had been studying the populations of Mississippi towns and had decided he couldn't draw enough fans there to make a good living. When they got together and began to work on booking ideas, they both knew enough about the demographics of their region and their biggest city. Ladd's insistence on pushing Ray Candy as the black babyface beating the hated Ernie Ladd didn't just pay off with the one-record Superdome crowd. He confirmed for both men that they needed a black babyface to continue to draw big crowds into the future. It was a business decision. Neither man was making a statement for civil rights. To the extent that they were political, they were libertarians, they believed the free market should decide. In some ways, it was just another booking move, except that it was unheard of at the time, and it paid off so well for so long. Although the junkyard dog was the king of New Orleans for the length of his run, it was the decision to base the entire territory around him that really broke barriers. City promotions, as mentioned, often featured an ethnic baby face as the big star. Those stars were mostly Puerto Rican, Italian, or Mexican. However, in a couple of cases they were black. Sailor Art Thomas had, indeed, been a sailor. He went into the Merchant Marine Academy after leaving the Wisconsin orphanage where he grew up. He got into bodybuilding, and when he left the service he joined a bodybuilding troupe. From there it was a short jump into wrestling. By age 19 in 1943, he had become a full-fledged wrestler. He was not only one of the first black stars of the sport, but he was one of the first bodybuilders in wrestling. He was ahead of his time when it came to muscle man physiques. In his prime, his size and definition were amazing. By the 60s he was a huge star, headlining in places as diverse as Texas, Washington D.C., and Toronto. In the early 60s, Thomas held the Texas heavyweight title twice, and was the biggest star in Houston, the city-state promotion that would one day join Mid-South. Thomas also challenged for the NWA world title held by Buddy Rogers. He would hold the Detroit version of the world tag team titles with Bobo Brazil, and in the 70s he would claim the World Wrestling Association, WWA, version of the world title in Indianapolis. As big a star as Thomas was, however, he didn't match the star power of his sometime partner, Bobo Brazil. Born Houston Harrison trained by Joe Savoldi, Brazil was originally called Boo Boo until a typo renamed him Bobo. He was born in 1924, the same year as Thomas, in another future Mid-South city, Little Rock, although he ended up making his home in Michigan. Brazil didn't have the athletic pedigree of Ernie Ladd, or the refined build of Thomas, but he was a huge man at 6 feet 6 inches and 275 pounds. He got into wrestling in his 20s, and ended up being a headliner for nearly five decades. For many of those years, Brazil was a touring attraction, crisscrossing the country much like an NWA touring champion. In the South, that meant dealing with the issues of Jim Crow and segregation. In many places, there were laws that kept black and white athletes, including wrestlers, from competing against each other. In fact, part of Ladd's success came from the fact that Brazil needed black opponents, and only a huge guy like Ladd, or a monster gimmick like Abila the Butcher, could match up with him physically. When cities did allow mixed matches, Brazil was often part of the historic events. For instance, the first integrated match in Atlanta finally took place on October 9, 1970, when Brazil and El Mongol beat Mr. Ito and the Great Oda. On other occasions, Brazil had urban promotions based around him. During the late 50s and into the 60s, he headlined Washington, D.C., for capital sports.
Vince McMahon Sr. used Brazil as the top babyface in his home market and as a top star in the rest of his cities. McMahon also used a black man, James Dudley, as his city promoter, choosing him to run the local Turner Arena. Dudley, who started working for Jess McMahon, Vince Sr.'s father, became the first black to run a major arena. Dudley also managed Brazil at times. In the 70s, Brazil settled down in his home state and worked in the Detroit territory for the Sheik. Brazil held the United States heavyweight title nine times over more than a decade, and was a top star in the territory, arguably the biggest. Certainly he was the top long-term babyface. However, the promoter, the hated Sheik, was really the top star, with everyone else being programmed to try to stop his reign of terror. Later in his career, Brazil was a top star for the Indianapolis promotion, holding its WWA world title twice. Although historians don't consider it an actual world title, it was promoted as such, giving Brazil some claim to the mythical title of first black world champion. Brazil did get programmed into an NWA title feud with Buddy Rogers, challenging Rogers nearly a dozen times across the country during the early 60s. In one match, Brazil defeated Rogers and won the title, but it ended up being a screw job. Brazil returned the title the day after the match, after Rogers claimed he had been injured before the bout. The promotion debunked Rogers' injury claim and billed Brazil as the world champ. However, the NWA did not recognize the title switch, it was likely just a promotional gimmick to avoid having Brazil lose. The local promotion could bill him as the uncrowned champ, and Rogers could continue to be the touring champion. Regardless, Brazil was a pioneer and a legend in the years before the junkyard dog. He also had longevity headlining for more than 40 years and wrestling into the 90s, retiring only a few years before he died at age 74 in 1998. He was still active in 1979, when Bill Watts went looking for a black Superman. In fact, Brazil spent the early 80s headlining for Dick the Bruiser's Indianapolis territory. However, he was 55 years old in 1979 and moving across the country for a seven-day-a-week territory with awful travel conditions could not have been appealing. He also had a popular restaurant named Bobo's Grill in Benton Harbor, Michigan. He worked for the Bruiser out of friendship and a love for the business. Had Watts or Ladd seriously considered Brazil for the spot, he would have likely turned them down and stayed home to run his restaurant and be near his family. Had he accepted, he may well have gotten over and succeeded, but it is doubtful he could have sustained a five-year run on top. In the 60s, Brazil took a young, black Canadian wrestler named Wade Bowles under his wing. Bowles was born in Nova Scotia and raised in the wrestling hotbed of Toronto. He had trained in boxing, been a sparring partner of heavyweight champ George Foreman, and got his wrestling training from Peter Maivia. Later he would marry Maivia's daughter, together they would have a son who would become one of wrestling's biggest stars. In 1964, long before Sylvester Stallone made the name Rocky famous, Bowles took the moniker Rocky Johnson and began wrestling. By the early 70s he was a star, challenging all over the country for the NWA world title. He never quite reached the level of Ladd or Brazil. He had a stint in the tag team heavy mid-Atlantic as mass mid-Carter Sweet Ebony Diamond that didn't click, for instance, but he was a star in important territories, like St. Louis, Los Angeles, and parts of Canada. Johnson might have been a good candidate for Mid-South, had Mid-South been able to afford him. He was 35 years old and in his prime in 1979. He had good charisma, was a better worker than JYD would ever be, and had good fire on the microphone. He had great success in cities with big black audiences, like Brazil's old stomping grounds, Washington, D.C. As with Brazil, however, it was unlikely that he would turn in his cross-country fame to make thousand-mile round trips from Oklahoma to Louisiana and back. In any event, in 1982 Johnson became a headline attraction for the WWF, working as the number two or three babyface in the Federation under Bob Backlund and Jimmy Snuka. So, had he worked for Mid-South, he would have likely jumped to the WWF long before JYD. As it was, Johnson didn't actually stay in the WWF through the national expansion. He spent 1983 challenging for the Intercontinental title before settling for the tag team titles, beating the Wild Samoans with partner Tony Atlas. By 1984, when he and Atlas lost the belts, Johnson was winding down. He spent a few months putting over the new talent imported for the national run. When he left, he became semi-retired. No one ever seems to totally retire in wrestling, working for his mother-in-law in Hawaii and overseas. He wouldn't really return until his son became a star, first as Rocky Maivia and then as The Rock. Even then, Johnson only came back for a cameo appearance. Johnson's partner for the WWF tag team belts, Tony Atlas, was another potential candidate. Unlike the others who might have seemed too big for Mid-South, Atlas would actually end up working for Watts in the early 80s, feuding with Jim Duggan and Ted DiBiase during the Rat Pack days.
However, timing plays a big role in wrestling. Atlas, whose real name is Anthony White, was in the middle of his first big run in the WWF in 1979, a run that would end up with him defeating Hulk Hogan. Hogan was three years away from his reign as WWF champion, and would lose feuds to Andre the Giant and WWF champ Bob Backlund, but he was seen as a budding superstar. By booking Atlas to beat Hogan, the WWF showed that they thought Atlas was a budding superstar as well. In fact, at Shea Stadium in August 1980, a show with a headline match that featured Bruno Sammartino gaining revenge on his turncoat protege, Larry Zbysko, Atlas challenged for the Intercontinental title. His match against Ken Patera was third from the top, and he would win by countout. Atlas might have fit the profile for Watts, but the big money of New York was more than Mid-South could ever afford. Vince Senior was still in charge at that point, and he had good relations with Watts and the other regional promoters. He got his pick of talent, and everyone else respected his choices. Even if Watts had wanted Atlas, he wouldn't have been able to get him. And, like Johnson, Atlas left the territories in 1983 for a job in the WWF. Much like his tag team partner, he wasn't really a big part of the WWF expansion. Although he had a couple of stints with the national WWF, they were mostly spent putting over newer acts. As with the junkyard dog, Atlas's career got sidetracked by cocaine, and he never fulfilled his early promise. If talent and potential had been the only criteria, Perhaps Watts would have picked his old friend and Georgia legend Claude Thunderbolt Patterson for the spot. Patterson had been a huge star in the early 70s, gaining fame during the time of the Georgia Promotional War while Watts was helping the NWA group fight the outlaws. However, Patterson ended up angering the alliance by switching sides, and was blackballed from wrestling for many years. Watts liked Patterson personally, but he also felt that Patterson had a chip on his shoulder. In a way, Patterson was the anti-Ernie Ladd. Ladd turned the other cheek to everything, even gross offenses, and made big box office revenue his entire career. Patterson saw injustice and offense in everything, probably even when it didn't exist, and it cost him a good portion of his career. I wanted Patterson to succeed in Georgia because I was coming to realize that a promotion needed a black star, Watts wrote. Just look at the demographics. We had so many loyal black fans it just made sense. Thunderbolt had been through a lot though, and sometimes you couldn't count on him to represent your promotional concepts. He was a loose cannon. It got to the point where I couldn't do much with him because I couldn't count on him. As it turned out, Patterson did return to wrestling during the JYD era, but not in Mid-South. Instead, he returned to his old glory in Georgia. He patched things up with the shareholders of the WTBS wrestling show and Ole Anderson, the partner who ran it. Anderson featured Patterson on his Georgia show before and during his battle with Vince McMahon over the WTBS slot. Patterson co-hosted the television show and was treated like a legend. He worked a select few television matches and more in-house shows, but didn't make a difference in the war. Unlike many Georgia wrestlers, Patterson didn't make the jump to the Crockett promotions when the NWA bought the WTBS spot from McMahon, and disappeared from wrestling in the aftermath. With most of the established names out of the question, Watts took a risk on Sylvester Ritter. Still, it was a calculated risk, the type made in wrestling all the time. The uncalculated factor was the political risk that was tied to the history of New Orleans, Louisiana, or NOLA as it is locally known. For the most part, locals don't call it Nolans, only tourists do. Depending on their ethnic or geographic background, most locals pronounce it New Orleans or New Orleans in some ways, New Orleans is a typical southern city. In others, it is the antithesis, the simmering Sodom the city many southern Baptists blame for a vast number of ills. It is the place where tourists come, do stupid things, and then avoid responsibility for their actions, blaming the city instead, Las Vegas with better food and actual, rather than fabricated, culture. It is not quiet, not polite, and quite often not safe. It is also not the sick, sinful city others make it out to be. It is, however, multicultural, multiracial, and threatened by its environment in multiple ways. Half of New Orleans is below sea level, and the city lies directly in a hurricane path. It is heavily Catholic, where most of the rest of the South is largely Protestant, especially Baptist, and it may be the only place in America where insulting the French could get you into a fistfight. New Orleans has a chip on its shoulder from years of neglect by the federal government and corrupt local and state governments. The chip has gotten bigger in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and the 2010 Gulf of Mexico oil spill. Yet despite its faults, NOLA is home to some of the most passionate, most artistic, most wonderful people in the world. They are proud, faithful, happy people. And they were the junkyard dogs people. New Orleans and southern Louisiana are different from the rest of the South, due to the area's religion, its people, and its mix of French and Spanish culture, but it doesn't differ in terms of race. 
New Orleans did big business during the slave trade, and Louisiana plantations were typical of the antebellum South. One of the biggest slave revolts took place in nearby Laplace, and anti-Reconstruction riots happened in the heart of New Orleans. Segregation was particularly brutal in Louisiana, where white supremacists had virtual free reign to terrorize black people who wanted to vote or take their place in free society. The civil rights era was a struggle for the city and the region. The backlash to integration and school busing has spurred large-scale white flight, and a private school industry that continues to thrive. As in many big cities, there is still de facto segregation, especially in housing. In many ways, racial peace has never been completely achieved, or at least racial tension still simmers beneath the surface of the culture and the society. This racial injustice was displayed to the world when thousands of mostly black citizens were stranded at the Superdome in the wake of Hurricane Katrina while a white governor, a white president, and their white advisors struggled to help them. Barack Obama picked a painting that depicts a scene from New Orleans to hang outside the Oval Office. The Problem We All Live With, by Norman Rockwell, shows federal marshals escorting a small black girl, Ruby Bridges, into a newly integrated New Orleans school in 1960. You don't have to search too hard to find modern bigots who object to the decision to display the painting outside the president's office. Moreover, in one historian's opinion, Louisiana has consistently covered up or misleadingly recounted its racist past. James W. Lowen chronicles mistakes and outright lies that history classes and historical sites and markers convey. In his book, Lies Across America, What Historic Sites Get Wrong, Lowen gives Louisiana a dubious achievement. Historical markers and monuments in Louisiana supply a condensed tour of what has gone wrong in black-white relations in American history, and how whites have lied about it. Lowen points out several examples near New Orleans. The historical marker in Laplace doesn't mention the slave revolt, even though the state has sanctioned a marker that does. For some reason, however, this marker was never ordered, and a private investor came up with an alternate sign that reads, Town of Laplace, named when a railroad stop was established on the Basile Laplace Plantation in 1883. Not to be outdone in nearby Colfax, where the single largest revolt against Reconstruction, and democracy itself, took place, the historical marker describes the massacre of 150 black men as the end of the carpetbag misrule in the South, even though it was not the end of Reconstruction in the South, and the elected officials of Louisiana were not carpetbaggers. Still, the city of New Orleans itself outdid its rural rivals with a white league racist symbol that was put up to mark the overthrow of the city government. That government, under federal jurisdiction, was ironically led by former Confederate General James Longstreet. The marker saluting the revolt against his command is, in Lowen's opinion, the most overtly racist icon to white supremacy in the United States. Indeed, from Strom Thurmond to David Duke, America's most prominent racist leaders have gathered and rallied at the marker, placed to the heart of the city, where Canal Street meets the Mississippi River. Dubbed Liberty Place, the Orwellian name celebrates the liberty that racist whites had finally seized in 1877 to suppress black voting rights. The white lead marker has since been moved, but it has often been a cause of racial provocations. Someday in the near future, you can imagine a Tea Party rally for its restoration. Is it any wonder, then, that New Orleans suffered, along with the rest of the South, with another 80 years of segregation after the failure of Reconstruction, and an additional 20 years of backlash after the civil rights movement. In some ways, very little has been settled in the city's violent, racist, and oppressive history. And yet, in the 70s, this was the place where Watts and Ladd decided they needed a black star. That Sylvester Ritter stepped up isn't all that surprising, in retrospect. He had already been a headliner in far-flung Calgary, with a gimmick that used his race for heel heat, no less, and he had the size, physique, and athletic background that Watts wanted. The junkyard dog did, indeed, attract the black fans that Mid-South wrestling craved. Large numbers of black fans turned up in New Orleans and throughout the territory to see Watts's new star. However, one of the most amazing things about the success of Mid-South and JYD, given the history of the area and the fresh scars of integration, is that he ended up being a crossover star. With the exception of the legitimate sporting events that Watts emulated, there was nowhere in the South in the 70s and 80s that saw such a mix of races, not to mention sexes and ages, than a wrestling crowd. The multicultural crowd in the old television tapings from Shreveport is inspirational. Black children sit next to white children, and all of them cheer for JYD. Often you see old white women sitting next to 20-something black men, all of them cheering and booing in unison. This isn't the present day when SEC football unites and divides the South based on uniform colors, like purple and gold or crimson and white, rather than skin color. This was 1980 when most of the people in the audience remembered a time when the races would not have been allowed to sit, or eat, or sleep, or go to school, with one another. It's an amazing thing in retrospect, 
and despite the fact that it was just wrestling, it is a history worth remembering and honoring. It would not have been possible without Watts and his employees, but it was Sylvester Ritter's charisma that made it work. At the time, he was loved by everyone, or at least almost everyone. The United New Orleans, the state of Louisiana, Mississippi, and later Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas like no athlete or entertainer before him. As evidenced by the failed attempts to recreate the magic with other performers, JYD had a unique popularity that would never again be matched in Mid-South. In 1979, Watts and Ladd got it right with their booking. Despite the hassles and the headaches, they found their star. The next step, of course, was booking him to be a star and putting him into the right feuds. To do that, they needed a foil for JYD. In some ways, who they picked to headline against him was even more shocking to the wrestling world than the decision to make Sylvester Ritter the top dog. And once again, their decision worked out in a big, big way.